mic check. Hello, hello. Chat, is this going to be on your channel too? So that's a great question, Andy Trotty. These are on Turner's TV on YouTube. So we're live streaming, but they'll also be posted. So if you want to go back and watch it with like stuff like Jim's, there's a lot of little details you probably didn't even pick up. You can go back and watch it whenever you want. So Turner's TV, Turner's TV on YouTube. Uh, so everybody, this is Bob Reynolds. Bob is from Unique Wood Supply and Design. Uh, Bob is an expert at river tables, like charcuterie boards, awesome resin stuff. Um, what else do you do? What is he good at? He's a decent hunter, not great. He's a hunting. Anything else you can think of? Bob's good. Bob's good. So he's going to talk about charcuterie boards and resin, I think. Yeah, just go to the and, basics. Uh, Bob, take it away. All right. How you guys doing? Good. All right. So Bob, owner of Unique Wood Supply and Design. Um, I have a shop out here in Glendale, Arizona. Uh, we do have a um, small storefront that we do sell all these supplies with, along with slabs. We got slabs from charcuterie boards up to large dining table slabs, um, local wood, Arizona woods, uh, walnuts, you know, from Midwest, Northwest wood. So we have a wide variety of slabs. Everything's kiln dried. Most of it's already already surfaced, so it's ready to go. So today we're just going to go over the basics of uh, charcuterie boards. Usually if somebody's going to start doing epoxy, want to try it out, I usually recommend starting with this because it's not that expensive. It's expensive, but it's, if something happens, you're not out a lot of money instead of jumping into like a large dining table or a coffee table. Um, man, I don't know where to start. I've never done demos like this before, so sorry, it might be a, kind of a fun joke thing. All right. I know, I know. See, you got me nervous going, because I already know you. Okay, so um, there's two different forms you can do. You can make your own forms using MDF or HDPE. You do have to use tuck tape or Tyvek tape that you want to lay down on there, because the resin will stick to it, and you'll just have a disaster. Uh, we did that for years. Um, it's great, it's easy, it's inexpensive. You can only use them a few times and then you pretty much gotta throw them away. The next way, if you're gonna keep, if you're gonna start making stuff and you're doing it on a regular basis, the next thing is to do is go to HDPE forms. So these forms are reusable. Um, it's nice, you don't gotta seal nothing off, you don't have to worry about leaks. Basically, you put it in, you pop it out and it's ready to go again. She knows because she has quite a few of them. Um, yeah, so let's start off with that. So basically, you take your wood, you want your wood to be already surfaced. You want to be surfaced top and bottom. Because obviously you don't want epoxy, you know, leaking down under, underneath there. You cut them to size. These forms do, these forms are made at a, at a five degree angle. The reason for that is when you go to go demold this, it can actually fall out so it's not just straight. So you do, might get epoxy along the edges. Um, but what you, we usually do, a few things you can do, um, wood floats. Wood floats and epoxy. So you've got to get this to hold down. You can do a few different things, HDPE blocks, clamps, clamp it down. Uh, the mistake that a lot of people ha do is that they don't lay it on something flat. So if you got a larger form, because we have these forms up to um, 10 foot by 4 foot. I mean, it's got full dining table size. Can you see what you have in the fridge? And what? No, form's just empty. Okay. I just set these inside here. No, no, yeah. It's just the form. Yeah, yeah. We just I just set the wood down inside here. Um, with the HTP forms, you do not have to. Um, it's never gonna hurt to do it. I do on my larger forms, uh, like the dining table forms are like a 36 by 72. Just because it's such a large piece, if it does help me out, mentally it does, so it makes it easier. These basically, that was sitting right in there. Let's see if I can get it with that falling out. There you go. They just sit inside there. So you make your river to any size that you prefer to have it. You want a smaller one, larger one. Um, if you don't use the blocks, I mean, I've put um buckets of resin on here you just got you got to do something to hold the wood down because the wood will float the stuff we do a lot is seal max 
So we sell this at our shop. This stuff works great on the HTPE forms. It dries within five, 10 minutes, but the big thing for us is it peels off of the form easily. Other silicones, you're sitting there, you're scraping it and stuff, and obviously you don't want to damage your form. I usually just put a dot here, here. We set it down, and then we're good to go. Um, to hold the wood down. Yeah, yeah, so I'll just put a dot on each side of this. We'll set this down inside here, push down on it and hold it. Just because, you know, it's, it's always hard to set up something with clamps and have everything around. This for me is speed because we can do 10 of them at one time and we're done, we're pouring. What kind of stock is that again? It's Sealmax. Seal yeah, we are the only distributor in the U.S. with this stuff. So we have this online and at our shop. Um, now there's multiple different ways of pouring your charcuterie boards. You could do a full pour where there's epoxy all the way to the top, or you can do a color and clear. Um, so it's kind of whatever you, the look that you're looking for. The key is to make sure you use the right epoxy for your job. So a lot of like we do a shallow pour and a deep pour. Shallow pours up to three quarters of an inch. Anything over that, you're gonna destroy your whole project. The res will overheat and uh, pretty much just throw it away and start over. So with that, we use for the shallow pour, we'll do half color, wait 24 hours, and then do clear the next day. So then we can get this kind of look, a color clear look. Um, once you're done pouring your clear, you let it sit there for about three, four days to demold it. You don't have a rubber mallet, do you? All right, mallet, I guess it don't matter. So when you go to go demold these, you take a rubber mallet. Don't, don't use a regular hammer because you will destroy it. Take a rubber mallet, you hit the inside of the form, and you hear a cracking sound. The first time you hear that, you're going to think you just broke everything because it is loud. Uh, once, and all you're doing is that you're demolding the form from the epoxy. You hit the inside all the way around. You flip it over. I usually just drop it a little bit. 90% of the time, it'll fall right out. If not, you just hit the back of it, and the piece pops right out. The downfall about the forms, if you poured your epoxy wrong and your epoxy never gets hard, it's not going to want to come out of the form. So you got to make sure you do things correctly, or if you try to pull it out too early. The epoxy needs to be fully cured for it to come out of the form. As soon as it pulls it out of the form, have wood ready, throw something in there, throw the silicone to get it pouring so you're always you know, using this. These can be used, I mean, for years. We've had ours for years, and they're, they're still, I mean, they're beat up, but they still work great. Um, any questions? What type of epoxy are you using? I use, we carry two different brands. I do Ico and Olog in epoxy. Those are the two brands that I've been, um, Ico I've been using for about four years, Ange? About three years. Old login, probably about a year now. So it's kind of just which one. I, I like them both. No, once epoxy is fully cured, it's totally food safe. You never want to cut on it. You don't want to call them a cutting board. I got see people saying they're cutting boards. You don't want to cut on epoxy because one, you'll damage the epoxy. Number two is obviously if it does chip off, nobody wants to eat epoxy. We got enough chemicals in our food already, so <laughs> we're good there. When you're going to set that up now, are you setting it up so the bottom is actually the top? So you just need to like flip the board over, or is it? No, the top is the top. is the top. Yeah, so then you can actually see what you're gonna do. Um, yeah, so that's. Uh, Sorry, my mind went blank there. Um, yeah, let me go on to my next one. I'm sorry. I got a lot on my mind here. Okay, so, um, yeah, any more questions? Are you going to talk about colors later? Um, yeah, well, we, we can do it right now. So when it, when it comes to colors, we use mica. Uh, we, you know, we're a fan of eye candy. Um, we also use Olog and mica. They have theirs, too. So when it comes to that, it's... it's any color mica that you want to use, you can use dyes, you can use transparent. 
there's no right or wrong way. So it doesn't have to be a it doesn't have to match the epoxy. You can you can use the eye candy. Oh candy. yeah, 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 yeah. You can use whatever you want. Um, you know, I, it's different brands of mica seem to work a little bit better. Uh, but yeah, you can do any kind of mica, any kind of dye. Uh, one of the epoxy companies prefers people not to use alcohol dye. They just regularly use non-alcohol dye. Um, you know, and I don't know if it's because he sells his, you know, or he just says the alcohol seems to want to mess with the epoxy on the larger pores. So, um, now what? Man, my mind is blank. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Yeah. If you want to embed something in the resin, you do what, a two color tour? How, how, how do you do that? Um, so well, usually what we do, so it's if you want to put something into the resin, how would you do the pour? Right. So what we would do is when we've done ours, we've done like a color first. And then what I'll do is I'll pour a very thin, thin layer, you know, 16th of an inch on there the next day and we'll stick whatever we want to put on there on the resin because I want that to cure. So when we do the clear on top of that, that you don't have the pieces moving around. So the thin layer is also the same color? Uh, no, it's it just layer. clear, clear here because it's so thin, you'll never, you won't really see it. Cause you're going to do clear on top of that. Um, but whatever you want to, whatever you put in there, you want to make sure that it's pre-sealed. So uh, I had a customer do um, wine bottle corks. You, Definitely got to pre-seal those because you're going to get air bubbles. It, yeah, it's, it's just going to go. So certain rocks you want to, we've done glass, we've done uh, the smooth rocks. You know, we have no issues there. But um, I haven't done those. Yeah, that was that. That's my wife. So she's just helping me out. So yeah. So we 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 had a customer do rocks, and uh, on your first pour, you got to think is even though everything surface, things shift and move. You know. So when you got to go run it back through the planer to get everything done, you want to make sure you give yourself some extra room because when you start running it back through the planer, obviously you don't want to hit whatever you set in there. So I like to give at least a quarter inch um, of the first pour before we start putting anything, any objects in there. So question about the viscosity of the resin. Just my only comparison is liquid diamond. Okay. So with liquid diamond, you wait a while before you make your pour, or pass in this case, I guess, to get your swirls or whatever you're going to get. Is that the same with the kind of resin you use? So we used to use liquid diamonds. So we used liquid diamonds for years in the very beginning. Um, I realized after all these years of pouring, we mix up the epoxy and we get into the form immediately. The faster we can get it out and open, less chance of obviously. Yeah, yes, yes. Yeah. So you're gonna you know, mix the epoxy, throw the color in, mix it up again. We pour it immediately, because the faster you can get it out of the cup, the less chances of it overheating, because obviously inside the cup, it's gonna, it, it, it's gonna heat up. Um, with eye coat, it takes about two to three hours to start setting up, obviously between winter and summer. So usually what we do is after we do our pour, I let it sit for about 10 minutes, I'll run it real quick with the torch. And uh, then about two hours later, I don't mess with it. I don't touch it, I just let it do its thing. About two hours later, I'll come back and I'll start touching the corner. When it starts getting really thick, where I think it's gonna set up, then at that point, I'll start doing my swirls. Now you might sit there for 20 minutes and redo the swirls multiple times, but you know, that you're just waiting for that perfect time because as you're doing your design, obviously if it's not thick enough, it's gonna keep moving. So you're gonna have to go back and redo it. And there's times you're gonna sit there going, please stay, please stay, you're begging it, and it doesn't because it looked cool. So all, when you do your swirls, all the color is already in the resin. You're not adding more resin or more color. That's no, 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 no. So we'll take, uh, we'll, we'll take a cup, we'll mix up our epoxy, we'll put the resin, in, I mean, we'll put the mic in there, and we'll mix that up and we'll just do a full pour. So like with this one here, we did the, our, yeah, this one was two, but so this one here, we had two separate cups of the green and the blue, and we just poured those together at the same time. When it got real thick, then we start kind of swirling it together. Three questions. Okay. Unique wood, are you open on Saturdays? Yes, 10 to th uh, eight to three. As far, as far as the mold, you mentioned price. Hey, um, 
How much, do you know how much this is at your shop that, that molds up? Yeah, this one's $125. Because then you, by the time you buy it, if I want to make that, I'm going to buy a sheet of whatever, and then I've got to buy the tape. Mm -hmm. Are we close to this cost? I mean, with, with wood the way it is? Um, all right, he's asking if it is what's more cost effective, basically, basically, of making your own form compared to buying something like this. I'm definitely going to go with buying a form if you're going to pour more than three, four, five times. Um, making your form takes time. So you got to take that into consideration. If you're at your house, you're doing it, you're having fun, you know, I know that that doesn't matter as much, but time-wise, we're all busy. So um, it does take a while to make your form, and I seem to only get about two or three pours just because we put screw holes in the side, and then the melamine cracks up and it breaks, and then you pretty much just toss it. So with this, um, then you have to make sure you do put silicone all the way around because if you get leaks. Yeah, because there's nothing worse than doing a pour and watching a pour epoxy fall. You're like flipping out, trying to stop it. Um, this one, you don't have to worry about it. So it's kind of, you know, it's kind of up to you. It, it's, I would say it's your, it's going to be what you plan on doing and obviously your budget. This up front's going to cost more, but it's going to save you in every other way afterwards. How do I... Okay, question is how do I how does he know how much to mix? That's a golden question. <laughs> that that is the hard one. So um, there is I do have an app on my phone, and you can take the length, the width, and the dip and get and depth and get your average. We've been pouring for years. I just look at it and look at my cup and I don't usually just I don't I don't figure that out unless a customer asks me about, and I'll be like, all right, this might be, doing these might take you, you know, almost a gallon. So then they know how much epoxy to buy. But I'll look at this, and I can just do my cups and kind of figure it out. In, in this situation you've got here, and I'm talking the total pour, you've got the section down, and I understand length times width times whatever, but you're also going to go around the sides, correct? Now, if you do not want it to go around the sides, what we do here is we'll, we'll take the silicone, and we'll run a little bead right here. And so when I stick that inside there, I'll block it off. But so it's gonna go underneath? No, no, no. You will lose, you'll always get a little bit of epoxy, minor, but the amount of epoxy that probably goes underneath here is probably less than what you have left in your cup that you throw away. So it, it, it's very minimal. I mean, if you do your calculations and it says 0 0.48, you're gonna be pretty close to get that to where you want it to be. Correct. You're going to wait X amount of time. 24 hours. Swirls, oh, yeah, yeah, to do the swirls. Mm -hmm. Come back the next day and pull your clear. Correct. Okay. That's perfect. That's it. <laughs> You're hired. <laughs> <laughs> the formula for volume is length times width times height times 0. 0.554. That'll tell you how many fluid ounces you need to fill that thing. I didn't see. I didn't know that. I just used an app. Right, right. Yeah, because that's just the downfall. A lot of stuff, doing it for years, I, you know, I don't, I don't think about that stuff anymore. I can just mix it up and pour it. And sometimes if you are a little bit short and you're like, okay, I need it, I need a little bit more, you can hurry up and mix more epoxy and throw it inside there. But the key is to make sure then you mix all of this together. So you're mixing the two pours. We've done that numerous times where you pour and you're like, man, I wish it was up a little bit more. Mix up some more epoxy, put that in there, and just make sure these, you know, go through the whole process of, you know, stirring your epoxy and get that all done. Um, we pour it inside here, and then we go back over it again. How, you, are you doing flush with the two pieces of wood? On the final coat? On the final coat. 
on the what? I'm sorry, so in, on the clear. Yes. So, so yeah. on the clear coat, yes. Question was on the clear coat, how high do we go? I go right to the top. I go a little bit over. Um, if you see my dining tables, I, there's epoxy all over them because none of that matters to me. I go through and I try to fill in every hole and void because I want to do all the major work now. So when I'm done surfacing it, it's less work for me later on to go back and fill in the holes. Can you talk about that surfacing? Yeah, so after this is, after, so that he, that he, he's asking about talking about surfacing. So after this is cured, we go ahead and we pop it out of the form. We do run them through our planer. A helical head planer is gonna obviously be the best. You will get chip out in the epoxy, unfortunately. I've never found a way not to get it. I barely turn the handle and it feels like, I mean, I'm just doing less than a 16th of an inch of, of a pass. And what we usually do with all the holes, we'll fill the holes in with CA glue. And, um, because then, you know, CA glue, when it dries, you won't be able to see it. And, it, and that's how we fill it. So you're always going to have a bunch of holes on there. And then um, for surfacing, so yeah, you can run it through your planer, or we have a large um, slab miser, and we put on our slab miser on the larger items, and we surface it on there. What were the guys home who use? Uh, their planer. Take it down to a woodworking place and have somebody run it through. On <laughs> <laughs> you know I, the the drum sander we usually run it through the drum sander after we run through the planer. So after you, you're always gonna have the small little holes you can just run that right through, and it takes out most of it. So you will definitely have, you know you'll t take out most of it. You'll definitely start to fill in some holes. Uh, we use jeweler glasses with L with a little LED light, um, and go through and really make sure that. You know, because I'm old, I can't see too good. Um, any more questions? What was, you said slab, was it slab miser? Slab miser. What is that? Uh, it's a machine for wood miser. It, all it does is surface slabs. With bandsaws or routers? Router. So it's like a CNC, okay. but uh, it's just a joystick control. We have a CNC. Um, then we went in and got that because it's a lot faster. Okay. Five inch head just for surfacing slabs. Um, does nothing else. It's just it. Okay. Okay, I have a question. Is that how you make the smaller version of the, and, and use it as a um, trigger or something? What kind of epoxy that's going to take the heat? Like I put a pot on top of it. Yeah, so. Yeah, she's asking what epoxy you can use for trivets. Um, we do sell a. Flood coat, I coat does sell a flood coat that they say that can go up to 500 degrees. So he does countertops. I personally have never tested it out, but as long as whatever you put on there is gonna start cooling down immediately. So oil is gonna hold the temp, it will probably ruin the epoxy, but everything else, if it starts to cool down, it should not ruin the epoxy. I personally have not tried it. He's done it with all of his countertops for years. Stone coat? Yeah, I don't know much about them. You know, I, I just tried it on a little tiny mold that I was trying to see how that was going to help something. Did it hold up to it? Um, I don't know. I'll have somebody else test it. Is it better made? <laughs> yeah, I have not tested it yet. It's, it's, it's on my list of 500 things to test. Okay. <laughs> um, most of your casting epoxy have a very low heat deprivation. Yeah, I know most of them do. I was looking for something like that. But his countertop? Yeah, his countertop um, that he's used for years, it, he said it can handle up to 500 degrees. As long as whatever's sitting on there is going to start cooling off immediately. Obviously, oil's going to hold the temp longer, so it will ruin it. Um, what was the name of it again? Ico. Ico. Okay. Where did you get Ico? My shop. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so then when it goes to colors, there's no, there's no right or wrong way. You pick your colors, you pick your design. Uh, this one here, my wife made, we did two different colors. It was just something different to do. Um, you, could, you could stack colors on there. This one, you can obviously mix colors. Um, you don't want to put them in there. I mean, you guys make pens, so you guys kind of get the whole gist of that. 
Uh, obviously, you don't want to put them in there and really mix them together because then you're going to get this ugly looking. And yeah, and I have uh, pieces hanging up on the wall to show people what not to do. So then um, when it comes to sanding, sanding to me is going to be the hardest part of making any kind of resin charcuterie board, coffee table, dining table. Um, it's getting the resin clear again. So this one we poured color all the way to the top. If you pour color all the way to the top, you will not see your swirls or your pigtails as easy as if you do clear. When you do clear, you've got to be on par. So clear will definitely make you a better sander because it will show you every single mistake that you've done. Um, we, we prefer to use Abernet Ace sandpaper. Um, I do not like to hit it with 80 grit. I will avoid that at all costs. And we do not skip grits. So we start at 120 and we take it all the way up to 1,000. Now what we'll do is with the finish that we use, we'll take the wood up to 500, the wooden epoxy up to 500. Then we'll just work on the epoxy, take that from 500 up to 1,000 grit. And then after that, we'll take the Merco polishing pads and we found using them dry seems to work the best, just like this. And we'll do 1,000 through 4,000. So one, two, three, 4,000 with these. Um, obviously you're gonna hit some of the wood when you're sanding, we just try not to, you know, sand the whole entire thing. But with the finish that we use, we like the wood to be up to 500 grit. So like I said, when you're doing clear, by 400 grit, if you're sanding this by 400 grit, you should have a unifying scratch all the way across. So it should look the same. You should not see any pigtails. If you see anything different, this is why you use the jeweler glasses a lot. If you see anything different, then obviously you need to start going back down grits and resanding again. And usually what I do, I'll just mark off an area, just work on that area. But you just try to get a unifying scratch. So it seems like 400 grit is your, is the sweet spot. Anything above that, I've never really had pigtail. So if it looks good at 400 grit with the unified scratch, from that point on, I don't look anymore. We just sand. Sand, sand, and sand. Um, oh yeah, how long would it take to sand this from yeah. beginning to end? Uh, I would definitely probably be a few hours. Okay. Um, our large dining tables could take us a week. Uh, you know, a full-size dining table is usually about 40 to 50 hours, depending on the size. And, and there's sometimes we're sanding, and uh, my son works with me, and I was doing this dining table, and I just could not get that resin. I kept going up to four or 500 grit, seeing little pigtails. I'd start back at, you know, one, 150, 220, and I did it for three days. That table hated me. I hated the table. We did not like each other. So I finally told my son, you know what, dude, I'm done. I'm going to go do something else you finish this table. Half a day he had the table looking like glass. It looks so perfect. So it can definitely happen. Resin sometimes just doesn't like you. What happened? Oh, Shane, yes. Okay, so any questions up to that, sanding or anything? Okay, so it's if you're gonna put LED lights inside here. Um, I've never put them in a charcuterie board. We've done a waterfall desk with them, and we just kind of pretty much kind of hid the lights. You know, there's not really much you could do. I don't like putting. I've seen people put um, the lights inside the epoxy. I don't like that because if the LED lights ever go out, then you're pretty much. It's stuck in there, and I've had customers, unfortunately, that that's happened to. Usually, we put them below. We'll recess something in to put them inside there. That's always kind of a tricky part, because when you put them up close, you see the dots of the LED lights, and you kind of want to get that glow. Um, we did have a customer that actually made a small little piece of wood that kind of went underneath, so we laid the LED lights inside there. So it gave the glowing effect, not so much seeing every single... LED light. Was that it? Mm -hmm. Okay. 
So once you get everything sanded, and you're happy with the way it's sanding and when it's looking, looking good, um, our finisher choice is lowly oil. Uh, it's a natural oil. It's made out of hard wax and vegetable oils. It does, you can put a linker with it. You don't have to put the linker with it. If you do want to add the linker to it, you only add 10%, so it's very minimal. It does speed up the drying, which is kind of nice. So we can do a coat every other day, I mean every day, every 24 hours. Do you have a flathead screwdriver? All right. Linker, linker, linker. Um, yeah. Yeah. What did you say? Cross linker. Yeah. Okay. It's a yeah. It it is a cross linker, and it and it helps the uh, the oils. What did you say? Polymerize. Polymerize. Cure. Yeah. Cure faster. Yeah. I was like, man, I'm getting more info from you than the actual manufacturers. I'm telling you. Yeah, that's probably why. Okay, so. Like I said, it is an oil. We always like to stir it first, um, just to get everything all mixed up in there. Unless there's another word for that, for stirring. <laughs> no. Okay, agitate. We like to agitate it. Uh, Lolio. Yeah, it's L O L I O. Yes, we are the only distributor in the U.S. Okay, so mineral oil, so we, we've done cutting boards for years. We used to do a lot, a lot of cutting boards. Mineral oil will dry out. Mineral oil never stays on there good. Okay. It does not really protect the wood. Okay. Um, and you do have to put it on on a regular basis, especially after you wash it. So this right here, this goes, it soaks into the wood. It gets hard. And for like charcuterie boards and like all of our dining tables, this is all that we use. So it hardens up as a hard oil. Um, so we like to mix this up first. Then, um, I yes. I, uh, I use the spray lacquer can from Home Depot. Why would you just do that on there? I'm not talking to you, Chad. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, I don't like lacquer or polys. Oh, okay. um, it's, and to me, it's you're putting a coat on top of the wood, so you don't get to feel the wood. You're feeling the finish on top of the wood. I like to feel the oils. You actually get to feel the wood. Um, second reason is too, especially with dining tables and stuff like that, if something gets chipped out or somebody hits something that damages it, if you got a lock, lacquer or poly finish, you have to redo the whole entire table. With this stuff, you can just sand that area, work that area in, and uh, I mean, sand the area and get that area all smooth, work the oil back in. At first, you have about three, four days, it will look a little bit different because you got um, oxidized wood to freshly sanded wood. But after a week, it blends right in, and you'll never even know. So that's what I like about this. It's if something happened to it or got damaged, it's easy to fix. Um, How does that take the water from plastic? We have not had an issue yet. So I used to use a different product for years. We no longer carry it or deal with them. Uh, this one, I think we've been selling for about six months. I used it in my shop for about four months prior to selling it. Our stuff that we use, I've never had an issue, and I got a lot of dining tables and everything out there, and all my customers are saying everything's great. So I have not had any issues yet. How does it compare to Tylenol? That's a good one. I don't, I don't know much about tongue oil because I've never really used it. Depends there you go. <laughs> Oh, uh, yeah, how, how, does, how does lowly oil, oil compare to tongue oil? The problem with tongue oil, if you go to Lowe's or Home Depot and you buy tongue oil, if you read the patent, if you actually read it, it says tongue oil thick. 
Yeah, it's not oh, true tongue oil. It's a urethane. It's, it's a polyurethane thing. There's no tongue oil in it. It mimics tongue oil. That's why they call it tongue oil thing. True tongue oil is a polymerizing oil that may even have tongue oil. Uh, yeah, yeah. It doesn't say. It yeah, just says. True, if it's true tongue oil, it will cure rather than, you know, like mineral oil will never, doesn't cure. It just soaks in the oil. Yeah, and then it dries tongue out. Oil will actually cure. You can put it on a piece of glass and it will actually solidify. And so that's going to be similar. But a tongue oil finish is just basically white on top. Thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs> oh, we we have a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and and, any, and for all you local people, you guys can also go by the shop. Um, I won't be so nervous in front of a whole crowd doing this. I'll be able to talk easier, talk better. Oh, uh, <laughs> well, you can always call me. I, I a, lot, a lot of people will call me. I definitely explain everything. Um, so you can call me, text me. Um, so yeah. So what what we like to do with this is after we 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 mix up the oil, I just put a little bit inside of here way too much does not take much so a jar like this would probably do four full-size dining tables and that's you know three three to four depends on your dining tables and we do three coats on our dining tables I prefer to do three coats and it's three coats top three coats bottom and since I cannot it'd be hard to measure out what 10% of this is basically I just do a drop. Then we always stir this up. Then I like to use the white Scotch Bright pad. So our application method is different than what the manufacturer recommends. The way they recommend to do it, um, I personally didn't like it. I wasn't fond about it. They say stop at 180 grit. They talk about trialing it on and all that. And I, I just didn't like the way it came out. And, uh, and I don't like only sounding my wood up to 180 grit. I think that's just way too high of a grit or way too low of a grit. So what we found practicing was 500 grit seems to be where it'll give you a nice high sheen on the wood. If you want a lower sheen, just sand up to, you know, 320. I would probably, uh, you know, 220 would be for very low sheen. We take a white scotch Bright pad. Um, Does that board have any finish on it? No, this is just pure raw. Uh, my son finished it, I think sanded it this morning. So the wood sanded up to 500 grit, and then the epoxy's up to uh, the 4,000. No, so the white pad is a zero grit. So it has a it's zero. Black, I think, is 600. <laughs> grit maroon is like 400 or 320. So we do a white scotch spray pad. At first, it will take a little bit more oil because this is going to get saturated. So at first, once this gets saturated, you really do not have to put much on there. I prefer to put it on here. I don't like the trial it on method and stuff like that. We just, yeah, I'll set it up here. We put on here and it's simple to start. I like to do circular motions on it. And the key that we found with this oil um, that works best is less is more. It's better to do two or three light coats instead of one or two heavy coats. So um, we apply everything by hand, even, even our dining tables. I just prefer to apply everything by hand. Uh, I think it's more personal. I think you got better control over it. You can see it instead of going over it. I know a lot of people use, you know, the machines, the buffers. You know, I, I don't. I just still think it's, it's tiring on your arms, tiring on your hands. Listen, after all these years, we still get tired. We got to stop because your hand like to cramp. But basically, you just we, we do circular motions, go over the whole wood, and then after that, without adding more, I just go back with the grain. So the look you're trying to get is that if you can see oil all over the top of it, you put on way too much. You want to see where you can see a little bit of it or it looks you know, a little bit on the dry side. Now your first coat, 
your wood's not going to look beautiful. It, you can see splotchy parts where, where areas soaked in more than other areas. It does not look even. It looks kind of, you know, okay. That's fine. Let it go. As long as you know that you went over the wood with the finish, that's all you have to do. Um, you can keep massaging it back into the wood more. If you do have a lot of um, finish on there, you can just keep going back into it and just massaging it in. You wait about 10 minutes, 15 minutes max. The dust stuff does start to get hard pretty fast. That's why I like about the 10 to 15 minute uh, mark. You take 100% cotton cloth and we just buff it off. You do not have to use gloves. I use gloves because as soon as I grab the finish without gloves and start touching it, my phone will ring. Customer will walk in, so my hands are always full of oil. So yeah, like I said, we set up for about 10, 15 minutes. Take 100% cotton cloth. Uh, this is another key factor too. The blue shop towels don't work. You want something, the cheaper the cloth, the better. You don't want a really tight um, cloth. Yeah, you want it more, you, you want it to be more absorbent. Yeah, cheesecloth, it won't, you, you, you want it, so imagine it, 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 it's kind of like waxing your car. That, you know, whatever you put on, you want to make sure you get everything back off. It looks like the Costco uh, wash cloth. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh huh, they are from Costco. Oh. Yeah, so we do get these from Costco. So. Um, no, but I do have them in kits. <laughs> I, I do have kits, but I'll be honest, most of the time, somebody's new to this, we give them a cup, we give them a cloth, towel, we just give it to you guys the first time, just so people... Oh, this thing's leaking. How much is the can of this? is $48. And then we do have a larger one for 158 Then there's a smaller one. You want to grab that one? Uh, they're asking the cost of this. No, it's inside the bag. The real small one? Yeah. No, just this one. Then this small one right here is $25. This one does not come with the linker because 10% of this, they're just not, it'd be so, so uh, it'd be such a little can for the uh, linker. I think so. I think we might have some in there. The tray that you have there, when you buy, instead of buying multiple sizes, do you buy a divider? Is that what you put it? Yeah, so we have, our trays go from, what are they? Wow, my mind's blank now. They go from coasters, from coaster size trays, all the way up to our, our normal large one is 36 by 72. And then we do have some for the dining table. So there's everything in between. And there is a divider. So a lot of people buy the 36 by 18 inch form. Then they'll buy two 18 inch dividers. So you can do three pours at one time. Or you can get a 36 inch divider. So you can do it. We usually use the bigger form and just put dividers. So um, right now we're pouring a Microtheca eucalyptus bar top. And I just have my huge form out there. I just said, and then I put two small uh, dividers, just because it's easy. Okay, did you hold that up so you can see the back? Oh, the yeah. So this is the back, and this is one coat in the front. So your second coat will start getting. Oh, we didn't bring that walnut one, did we? I forgot it. I was gonna bring the other walnut one to actually compare it. So basically, uh, put that finish on. That was pretty much all you have to do. It, it really takes, it, it takes no time. You put it on, like I said, you wait about 15 minutes, you buff it off, and then you let it sit there. And then you wait till the next day and you pretty much repeat that process. <laughs> I definitely do two coats a minimum, dining tables, um, coffee tables, stuff that's gonna be used a lot more. We do three coats. You could do three coats on this stuff too. It's not gonna hurt. Yeah, yeah. 
I have not now. I have not tried it as like a friction. I don't. I don't have time to turn, but I have not tried it as a friction. But you can definitely just add it in bowls. You know. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, 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 for sure. Um, <laughs> there's a, no, no, no. Um, she asked how it compares to Odie's. Um, okay, so being very gentle on the situation, we were an Odie's oil distributor and user for almost four years. Um, we no longer carry Odie's, not due to the product, just put it that way. So we switched over to a different product. Um, I personally like this product better. I think it dries faster. It dries harder. We seem to have less issues with it. Um, definitely nothing wrong with Odie's. Um, you know, we still have some of it left and we have used it on projects, but, uh, yeah, I, um, if I had a choice, I'm happy with the route that I've went now. I'm happy with the business decision that I've made. Yeah, so, yeah, so like when, when we do our cutting boards, we honestly, we just do mineral oil. It's faster, it's easier, because uh, you're going to wash it a lot, you know, so, but with these, these are charcuterie boards, obviously, like I said, nothing with resin. You don't want to cut on resin because you're going to destroy the resin, so, but this stuff dries, it is food safe, you know, you don't have to worry about that. Um, but yeah, you just don't want to cut on charcuterie boards. Um, yeah, can you use this with, on just a regular cutting board? I personally have not yet because I still stick to the mineral oil method just because we've done it for years. Um, on our larger cutting boards that we do make, I do use this, but we call those like our brisket boards. And uh, I just don't do mineral oil. I usually do something like this because you're gonna have you know juicy meat sitting on there longer and stuff like that. So I'll grab this stuff and it's usually not cut on like every single day with a cutting board does. But with the cutting boards, we just still do our, our mineral oil and then we do our mineral oil beeswax that we make ourselves the next day. We soak the cutting boards usually for about four or five hours in a big 55 gallon bin and then we pull it out and we let it usually drip dry overnight. I would use this. Yeah, so we just delivered a big dining table to somebody's house and they had a new countertop done um, out of cherry wood and they put mineral oil for the finish. Well, the problem with that is mineral oil stays wet, it doesn't dry or it dries out. So the problem they had is anytime they set paperwork on there, the paperwork would get off of the oil. And then it's like they're always, and then it's always drying out so that it was always a constant having to apply it to it it never smoothed out, and so we took it to our shop, fixed it up a little bit, cleaned it up a, a, a little bit, then we added this on there, and they've had it for a month already, and they're saying it's, it's absolutely perfect. They don't have that issue anymore. So how would that like compare to like baking and flour and stuff like that? Like, I, you would have no issues. I mean, because this is like I said, we've, but we got, we've had them on dining tables for close to a year now. Uh, we've had, um, we got a customer that has a, that has a podcast and he's with his podcast table, and it's every single day. And it's, I see, I watch his videos at times, and I cringe, because there's drinks, everything, things spilling, and it's holding up fine. So yeah, it, I, don't, I don't think you will ever have an issue with it, but the great part about it is if something kind of did happen, all you'd have to do is just reply another coat of oil. Is that gonna be stronger than like Butcher Block Oil in there? Or is it well, Butcher Block Oil is just mineral oil with a little bit of beeswax. Yeah, and it's usually, if you look on the back, the amount of beeswax is so little. Um, you know, that's why we make our own beeswax, you know, our own like butcher block oil. But yeah, butcher block oil is just mainly all mineral oil. Yes, thank you. What do you seal the wood with before epoxy pours? So 
bubbles. Bubbles and epoxy is, are the worst. They're, they're enemies. We hate them. And uh, we're always going to get them. They're, you're always going to have them. You can always find them. So obviously, we want to make it as minimal as possible. So usually what we do is, um, let me back up on something else, too, that I, that, that I skipped. Before you do an epoxy pour, your edges here have to be clean. Clean as in sanded. It don't have to be sanded smooth. Then stop, you, know, you can do 120 grit, but it has to be perfectly clean. So if you have a little bit of bark, so people also want to leave the bark on there. You cannot leave the bark on there. And even if you leave, leave that really thin layer of bark on there, what happens is the epoxy sticks to the bark, but the bark does not stick to the wood. So you will have a failure and it will come apart. And it's not due to the epoxy, it's due to you know, you not setting up correct. So you definitely want to make sure that everything is clear, everything's sanded smooth. And I usually just hit it with 120 grit. I don't want to go up higher because you know, I, you know, I don't want to make it smooth. I just want it to be all clean. Then usually what we do is we take the same epoxy that we pour with, we mix them up, and we just do a thin coat right over the top. I let it sit overnight. You know, I usually, you know, I want that to kind of get hard. A lot of times if they're in the form, I take the cheap bristle brush from Home Depot and I'll leave it inside the form and we'll just put it on inside the form. Because it doesn't matter. A little bit of epoxy that's going to go down in the form. Um, first of all, it helps seal it so you don't get no epoxy to go un underneath. But you're not going to see it anyways because once you do your color pour and you surface it, that little bit down there will be gone. I just, yeah, so he's asking about a different um, finish to use. I just use the epoxy because I figure, well, it, it's, it's the same product going back inside here. So I, you know, because I know I've heard some people that they sprayed poly or they use different things. And I just would rather stick with the same product I'm going to pour, have it all together. All right, so he's asking if we drill holes inside the wood. Uh, no, we've been pouring epoxy tables for years, and uh, we've never had an issue. It, the, yeah, yeah, so the big thing is to make sure that this is clean. This is clean. I, I've, that's, I can't stress my customers enough to make sure that this is clean. We've, glued, we've made uh, charcuterie boards. We've thrown them in the back of our shop just to see what would happen. Um, and usually if something breaks... It's not the separation of the wood or the epoxy. It's, it's splitting across and just breaking. So I've never had that split across. Now, the only one that I did see was a customer did a new pour, and I think he was using, I think it was mesquite. And he did not take off a very thin layer. And he brought the piece in, and he's like, hey, look, it's in two separate pieces. I'm like, I've heard of it. I've never seen it. And I'm trying to figure it out because it was just so clean. You put it back together, and it just matched up. And uh, when I finally hit the light at the right angle, I saw a small little white spot. So I took my knife and I took off like half the size of a piece of paper, thinnest layer you could ever imagine, pulled right off. And that was the problem right there. So he was going to throw it away and I was like, you never throw nothing away. Let's see what you can do with it. So I told him, so we, I told him to go ahead and put more epoxy back on here, set it in there and do a small layer on top to make sure everything gets filled in there. And he did that and he's had it for four months and it's still held together. What was it? Can you mix epoxy? Okay, questions, can you mix epoxy like brands? <laughs> no. No, I would say stick with whatever brand you're using, stick with that brand. We do get that quite often. Somebody runs out of one and wants to come by mine to finish their pour. I will definitely recommend not to. Whatever you start with, I would say you stick with that brand all the way through your pour. Back to your sand oil. I assume you're using a rubber sand oil for your sand oil. Yeah, we use Festool. Yeah, yeah, we use, we use Festool. We use the RO150 uh, sometimes on our, like our dining tables. You're going to have the CNC marks just from the slide miser. So we'll, we'll take the RO150 and we will do, it's the larger of theirs, and we'll do uh, 120, 150, 220 with that. Then we'll go back down to the, e, the ECS150, which is their six inch, and I'll start back again with 120 just because it's not so aggressive and it seems like it really helps out. I have a Harvard oak table and it's stained. Can I put that stuff over the stain? Um, 
With any oil-based finish, they're usually going to tell you it's best not to. It's best to always put on raw wood because it is an oil finish, so you want it to soak inside there. The stain is going to kind of hinder it. So can you? Yes. Will it give it 100% protection like it would on raw wood? No. But that's what pretty much any finish will tell you that, any oil finish will tell you that. The biggest mistake that I've seen people make with resin. Um, not starting soon enough. <laughs> not starting soon enough. Yes. Um, I'm trying to think because there's, there's a few. So one of them is making sure your mixture is as close as possible. Number two is stirring. A lot of people do not stir enough. So that's one downfall. Or you can over stir. I've had people that stir for like five minutes and and you're over stirring the epoxy and while you're stirring it, you're also pushing air inside the epoxy. So you're gonna have more bubbles in there. And that I learned from the manufacturer. You know, you, you, you can under stir and you can over stir. So that is the big thing. And here with Arizona, um, the other big mistakes we see is, you know, most of us will pour inside your uh, garage. Well, epoxy is thermal epoxy. It can only heat up so high and it'll crack and split. Well, if your garage is already 105 degrees, you're already starting to max out the epoxy. So in the wintertime, it is okay to pour in your garage. Well, there's a point to that too. Um, yeah, there's, a, there's, it's kind of a back and forth. So you cannot pour in your garage when it's summertime. It, it, you need to be in a controlled environment. So when it's 110 in your garage, it, it's, you, you cannot pour. At the same time, when it's wintertime here, People leave their epoxy sit inside the garage. Well, when it's 40, 50 degrees, your epoxy's cold. That's also a downfall too. So when you go mix your epoxy, your epoxy's really thick. While you're stirring it, it's gonna create a lot of bubbles, have a white look to it. And it will harden and be fine, but you won't release all your bubbles. You'll notice you have a lot of more bubbles inside the resin because the resin was too cold. And it's nice to keep your resin about 75 to 80 degrees. So I usually tell people they're pouring in the garage in the wintertime, keep your resin inside your house and then bring it outside, pour and get it back inside your house. So epoxy is too hot, it's bad for it and too cold is bad for it. I torch, I don't like the heat gun. The heat gun seems like it blows the epoxy around. Um, torching, now that's another thing. Um, thank you for bringing that up. You can over torch. My wife is very famous for that. I've taken the torch away from her and put it in the back of the shop. <laughs> it's, I, I, I've had customers do that. Um, so usually what I do is we will do our pour of color. I'll let it sit for about five minutes. I'll torch it one time just to get off the majority of the, of, of the bubbles. Uh, then at that point, I say, you know, have a little bit of fun. You can play with your resin, try to get your design, see what you want to do. If you go down deep with the popsicle stick, shallow, the way you turn it. You kind of get your idea. I'll hit it one more time with the torch and then I personally don't touch it. I let the epoxy do its thing. And then um, come back at the end and then when you're finally doing your swirls, you just want to hit it as minimal as possible. Because some people that love to hit the torch for every little bubble, what has ended up happening is the top layer will get hard and Inside's not, and you get bubbles trapped. Or you'll literally, um, yeah, I've seen some interesting stuff. So, yeah, <laughs> you just, torching is, is, is good, but it's also bad. But I like it over the heat gun, because the heat gun seems to. Assuming you just let them make what the waves Now, when you're going to go do the waves, that's different, because you want to push the epoxy. So this rate, you're not trying to push the epoxy, and that's why I don't like using it at that point. I'd rather just do the torch. So, but yeah, if you're going to do designs and you're going to do the waves and stuff like that, yeah, at that point, you need to do it that way. I know, I'm kind of skipping around everywhere. Can you use the torch and then when fully finishing your room? Yeah, yeah. So we, we, we have a pouring room at our shop. So it's like an indoor room. Yeah. And, and yeah, we use, we use the torch in there. Uh, no, no, no. There's nothing to really go off in there. It's just a regular... Thing. And then the epoxies, well, m most epoxies, they have no VOCs, so they don't stink. Um, I, can't, I'm, I won't speak for all the other epoxies, but the stuff that we pour, we pour 
right there in my shop. We have a room. So if you walk into my shop, you will never know. I got, I've been pouring epoxy, but it's right there. You can see it. So, but it's, if you can pour in a controlled environment is obviously going to be the ultimate, you know, and I'll say just lay plastic down because you will drop, you will spill epoxy. So just lay plastic down before you pour. So we are at the end of Bob's time. If anyone has any final questions, and then Bob, if you can tell everyone your information, uh, cell, social security number, so I can get a hold of you. Any other questions for Bob? Why don't you tell him where you are and your website or whatever? Yeah, so my website is is uh, uniquewithsupplyanddesign.com. Everything's on there except I do not sell slabs on there. I get that a lot. So our slabs are only sold local right now. We will start putting up some charcuterie board kits for people that live out of state. We'll have walnut. We'll do a lot of like mesquite, silk oak. I'm trying to get a lot of Arizona wood because it's mainly here. and We can get it back to the Midwest. What's your Instagram or Tinder? Uh, and, <laughs> Tinder. <laughs> uh, Instagram is our business name. I, everything you can find me, it's just my business name. Uh, unique with spline design you go on uh, if you go on Instagram I post everything on Instagram it goes over to Facebook you'll but you'll see everything on Instagram you can see you know I usually do shots of what I've been doing or I'll talk about what I do on there we do have hundreds of slabs in our main shop, we do have a second shop with a kiln and our slab miser in there with hundreds of slabs there. Um, I've been told by my wife and my kids and friends that I do have a slab addiction. So I have admitted it, confirmed. I've confirmed it, and I'm gonna enjoy it and I'm just gonna keep buying more, right? Yeah. So, guys, sorry, I, I kind of scattered brain. I, I got something going on with the business this morning, too, and I got something in the back of my head before we came here that I got something that I'm doing with that. So, I'm just a little scattered brain, and I'm not used to talking to this many people at once. So, you come into my shop, as she knows, I'll talk your ear off. I can explain. I'm just a little nervous right now. Um, I'm not, I'm one to be uh, in the back corner and just watch people. I don't like being in the front. So, but, you know, and I've never done a demo like this, so I really, I'm sitting here, I've talked in chat going, I don't know what the hell to do, you know? So, but yeah, if you come to the shop, it's, I'm a little bit different. Um, and if I'm not there, my son is there. My son's worked for me about seven years. He does everything. He pretty much knows everything too. So if I'm not there, he will help you out 110%. Awesome. Good. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Uh, real quick for everybody here, the next uh, thing starts at 4.30, it's the panel. Yeah, so we're going to have a panel at 4.30, ask the expert panel if you have questions about like small business, we're going to have them tell little stories about how they Zach, got there. Curtis, Jim, stay here, is it Baba, right here, okay. yep, same spot. Uh, and then, Bob is staying, maybe not. We'll talk about it. <laughs> and then tomorrow, um, the big names are going tomorrow, Bob and I were just your warm up, we got Zach, Curtis. He's going to be talking about proliferating oils. And <laughs> <laughs> He's going to use big words, so. Pulverizing. Pulverizing oils and. Uh, you got Jim Hines doing a kitless on a wood lathe. So if you watched the threading this morning and were like, huh? Yeah. Come tomorrow and watch it on the wood lathe. It'll make a lot more sense. Uh, and then you got Zach doing a casting demo. And Elise from um, Starry Night doing Tomorrow's going to be awesome. We are having pizza, if that wasn't enough, with all those people. So like around noon, one-ish, whatever, we'll have some pizza. And hopefully everyone will stick around today and tomorrow. We'll see you then. So, so really, quickly, really quickly, really quickly.